In this lecture, you will discover how Daniel's dream of the four beasts corresponds with history. You see, my friend, God knows the future. You and I can trust him. Francois will now continue with this very interesting story. We are back at the site of ancient Babylon. This is where the mighty king Nebuchadnezzar, Nabukuduri Usar, had the dream of the huge image. Neither the king nor his wise men could recall the dream. But somewhere in the city of Babylon lived a God-fearing Hebrew youth who could. He speaks to the king. Daniel 2 verse 27 Daniel replied, No wise man, enchanter, magician or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. You know, we too have mysteries that no one can explain. But listen to Daniel's solution to all our mysteries. Verse 28 But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. As you were lying there, O King, your mind turned to things to come, and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. God was about to tell King Nebuchadnezzar that not only his kingdom would crumble, but all the kingdoms that would follow after him. The vision of Daniel 2 takes us from the time of Babylon, then to the time of the Medo-Persian Empire, followed by the Greek Empire, then the Roman Empire, and right down to our day. Tell me, how would you describe our society today? Do you think it's possible that more hearts can break and more tears can flow? If you are a victim of pain, don't despair. God is just about ready to come and wipe away all tears. Daniel 12.44 The God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. As I looked at the ruins of ancient Babylon, I thought of the many ruined, broken lives in our world. But fortunately, John the Beloved describes a society where there will be no more destruction. Revelation 21 verse 4 And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. This, my friend, is what God has in mind for you and me. No more funerals, either of loved ones or of relationships. Never again will you experience the uncomfortable feeling of pain. I'm looking forward to that day. What about you? And now for an exciting journey through the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel. Let us ask the prophet to tell us about this amazing vision. Daniel 7 verse 1 In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream, and visions passed through his mind as he was lying on his bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Archaeologists discovered an interesting piece of inscribed pottery called the Nabonidus Chronicle. It was written by the last Babylonian king called Nabonidus. History tells us that he entrusted his kingdom to his son Belshazzar in the year 553 BC. Exactly 50 years had passed since Daniel interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream in the year 603 BC. During this time, Daniel saw how Babylon fulfilled its symbolism as the head of gold. Now the empire was getting weaker and weaker, and the time for the next empire of silver had just about come. Daniel 7 verses 2 and 3 Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. How many symbols do you notice? Wind, sea and beasts. 
Who is going to interpret them for us? I've discovered that the Bible is its own best interpreter. So let's give the Bible the opportunity to speak for itself. Jeremiah, a contemporary of Daniel, has this to say. Jeremiah 49 verses 36 and 37 I will bring against Elam the four winds from the four quarters of the heavens. I will scatter them to the four winds and there will not be a nation where Elam's exiles do not go. I will shatter Elam before their foes, before those who seek their lives. I will bring disaster upon them, even my fierce anger, declares the Lord. I will pursue them with the sword. History tells us that the Assyrian kings, Sargon II, Sennacherib and Ashurbanipal made war on the Elamites. In 639 BC, Ashurbanipal conquered Susan, the capital, and took the captives to Samaria and various other places. As I examined some of the evidences of these attacks on the Elamite capital, I thought of the apt prophetic description of war, namely wind. Jeremiah 25 verse 32 Evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind. Isaiah 21 verses 1 and 2 As whirlwinds in the south pass through, and the spoiler spoileth. Zechariah 7.14 I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations whom they knew not. In his vision at night, Daniel sees four great wars raging over the great ocean. It seems to me that water represents nations and beasts represent kingdoms. But let us be on the safe side and ask the Bible to interpret these symbols. In Revelation you have a prostitute sitting on a scarlet-colored beast. She has a gold cup in her hand. And in a future lecture we will learn more about her. At this stage we want to know the meaning of the word water she sits on. Revelation 17 verse 15 Then the angel said to me, The waters you saw where the prostitute sits are people, multitudes, nations and languages. And now for the meaning of the word beasts. Who do the four beasts represent? Daniel 7 verse 17 The four great beasts are four kingdoms that will rise from the earth. Daniel 7 verse 23 The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on the earth. So let's do a quick review. The Bible tells us that seas equal people, Revelation 17, 15. It also tells us that wind equals war, Jeremiah 49, 36, 37. And lastly, that beasts equal kingdoms, Daniel 7, 17. So there we have the setting. Each of these four beasts represent an ancient civilization. Now we have to find out exactly who is represented by the first beast. Daniel 7 verse 4 says, The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off. And it was lifted from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. And a man's heart was given to it. Now who is this beast? What must we do to find out? In the first instance we have to look at the chiasm or literary structure of the book of Daniel. Chapter 4 and 5 belong together because of their common theme. In both chapters certain related events take place in Babylon. In chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar suffers from an exaggerated self-image and in chapter 5, Belshazzar reveals the same problem. The following judgment is pronounced on them. Nebuchadnezzar is symbolized by a huge tree that is cut down. He joins the beasts of the field where he spends seven years eating grass. You can also read about his mental illness on a clay tablet in the British Museum. 
Daniel 5.30 says that the judgment Belshazzar received was death. These two chapters, which are interpreted by Daniel, belong together in a literary, prophetic and poetic way. Let us look at the relationship between another two chapters. In chapter 3, Daniel's friends are cast into the fiery furnace. Why? Because they refuse to worship the image of Bel Marduk, which is a transgression of God's second command. The same kind of persecution is recorded in chapter 6. Daniel is cast into a lion's den because he refuses to obey the law that says you must pray to the king. Why? It is a transgression of the first commandment which says, You shall have no other gods before me. Exodus 20 verse 3 In chapter 3, Jesus joined the three Hebrew young men in the fiery furnace. In chapter 6, God sent his angel to protect his servant Daniel. What a God! There is an end time lesson in this for all of us to learn. Obedience is not optional for those who truly love Jesus. And now we look for the numerical relationship between chapters 2 and 7. In each of these chapters we find the mention of the word first. It speaks of the first metal and the first beast. The prophet himself supplies the numbers of the metals and the numbers of the beasts. We don't have to do it. The literary structure of these two chapters groups them together. In other words, if the first metal, the head of gold, represents Babylon, who would the first beast, the lion, represent? Babylon, of course. Let's call chapters 2 and 7, dealing with the fallen kingdoms, A. Chapters 3 and 6, that deal with kingly persecution, we call B. Chapters 4 and 5, deal with fallen kings, we call C. Come with me to ancient Babylon. Let's look at the archaeological evidences concerning the lion motif representing the Babylonian kingdom. Right at the entrance of the city, you will see these lines on the replica of the Ishtar Gate. Let's look for some more lines inside the city. In the museum, they only have one relief of the many lines that used to decorate the procession way for a distance of one and a half kilometers. Daniel looked at this very line you are looking at. Archaeologists left the worst of the lines in Babylon and took the best of the rest to other museums like this one you're looking at. This huge black basalt line used to stand in the palace of the king's courtroom. Archaeology clearly states that the line motif is a footing symbol for the Babylonian kingdom. And now we look at the greatest authority, the Bible itself. We want this inspired book to explain the meaning of the line that Daniel saw in his vision. Let's ask Jeremiah how he sees the Babylonian threat. Jeremiah 4 verse 7 A lion has come out of his lair. A destroyer of the nations has set out. He has left his place to lay waste your land. Your towns will lie in ruins without inhabitant. Daniel saw in his vision that the lion has wings on his back. This is not an unknown phenomenon in the ancient world. You will see lions with wings when you visit Petra in the Jordanian desert. Almost a thousand years before the Babylonians took Judah into captivity, the Lord gave this warning. Deuteronomy 28 verses 49 and 50 The Lord will bring a nation against you from far away, from the ends of the earth, like an eagle swooping down, a nation whose language you will not understand, a fierce-looking nation without respect for the old or pity for the young. In his book Semitic Mythology, Langdon refers to the lion-eagle combination that often appears in the Babylonian literature. It was the Babylonian lion that devoured Jerusalem. I told a group of people which I took to Iraq that prophecy had predicted that the cruel Babylonian lion would come to its end. Then I quoted from Daniel chapter 7 verse 4. 
The first was like a lion, and at eagle's wings I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. The second beast that Daniel saw emerging from the sea of ancient nations looked like a bear. Tell me, with which metal of the image would you compare the bear? The silver chest and arms, of course. Which kingdom did the silver represent? The Medo-Persian Empire. Listen to the interesting info that the prophet gives us. Daniel 7 verse 5 And suddenly another beast, a second, like a bear. It was raised up on one side, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. I get so excited when I visit these ancient sites like Ekbatana in Iran and research them in the light of Bible prophecy. During the 9th, 8th and 7th centuries BC, the Medes who made Ekbatana their capital were so mighty that they even posed a threat to the mighty Assyrian Empire. Interesting cuneiform tablets were recently discovered at Nimrut in Iraq, the northern part of Iraq. They tell of a treaty between the Medes and the Syrian king Esarhaddon. Daniel looks at the Medo Persian bear and he sees that he was raised up on one of its sides. Can history tell us which of the two eventually became the stronger, the Medes or the Persians? Yes, it was the Persians. In 550 BC, Cyrus the Great defeated the Medes, but he had a way of changing enemies into friends, so he invited them to become part of his mighty empire. And here you see the Median and Persian soldiers on a relief at Persepolis, decades after the death of Cyrus, still fighting for a common cause. The prophet sees three ribs in the bear's mouth, If this were a literal bear, the ribs would indicate that he had devoured other animals. In a prophetic context, the ribs tell us that the Medo-Persian Empire conquered three great nations. Did it really happen, and who were they? Come with me to Sardis in Anatolia in Turkey. This used to be the ancient capital of the Lydians and the home of King Croesus. Cyrus conquered this vast empire in 547 BC. This represents the first rib. When the Medo-Persian Empire defeated the Babylonians on October 12, 539 BC, the second rib was added. The mighty bear conquered Egypt in 525 BC and the third rib was added. What an amazing fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Don't miss out on the lecture of the vision of the ram and the he-goat in Daniel chapter 8. The ram, representing the Medo-Persian Empire, is pushing to the west, the north and the south. If you check the geography, you will notice that Lydia, modern Turkey, is to the north of Iran, which is ancient Persia, Babylon to the west, Egypt to the south. What an accurate prophecy. There is another interesting point concerning the bears that we should look at. Where do we usually find them? Well, in cold, hilly terrain. Media, with its capital Ekbatana, as you notice, was located in just such a place. The Assyrian and Babylonian armies had to ascend the Zagros Mountains in order to reach the Medes, on the high Iranian plateau. There is a good reason why Nebuchadnezzar built the hanging gardens for his wife Amuhaya, daughter of Sayacharis. She was used to the mountainous area of Ekbatana and couldn't get used to the flatness of Babylonia. So gentlemen, if your wife is unhappy with her present surroundings, do what Nebuchadnezzar did. Build her something beautiful. The cost is much less than a divorce. Can you still remember how many wings the lion had? Two. What would you say do wings represent? 
speed, of course. Daniel sees a third beast like a leopard emerging from the sea. Instead of two wings, he had four. This is telling us that the next empire would conquer the world at a tremendous speed. Listen to what the Bible says. Daniel 7 verse 6 After this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on his back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Now how can I identify the third beast? We will have to compare it with the third metal of the huge image. Can you still remember who represented the Bronze Empire? The Greeks were their young general Alexander the Great. Greece was a world empire from 331 BC to 168 BC. The shaggy goat of Daniel 8 also represents Greece. Let's see if the aspect of speed, the four wings, is repeated. Daniel 8 verse 5, as I was thinking about this, suddenly a goat with a prominent horn between his eyes came from the west, crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. I told my daughter Loretta about Alexander the Great who destroyed and burned the beautiful city of Persepolis while we visited here. I also told her about the tremendous speed with which he conquered the ancient world. Let me quote from my favorite Bible commentary while you look at the upper dana, the audience hall of the king. The symbolic vision represented the animal with wings added to it, not two, but four, denoting superlative speed. This symbol most fittingly describes the lightning speed with which Alexander and his Macedonians in less than a decade came into possession of the greatest empire the world had yet known. There is no other example in ancient times of such rapid movements. 2 Peter 1 verse 19 And we have the word of the prophets made more certain, and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. When Alexander the Great came to Babylon, which was destroyed by Xerxes in 480 BC, he decided to rebuild it. The very first building he wanted to restore was the Etamanonke or Tower of Babel. Archaeologists found a clay tablet on which the wages of 10,000 builders are mentioned. But before his plans got underway, he died in 323 BC. Alexander the Great conquered a world. He had all the money and manpower to restore Babylon to its former glory and make it his capital. But it was never realized. Why? God said through the prophet Isaiah that it would never happen. Listen. Isaiah 13 verses 19 and 20. Babylon, the jewel of kingdoms. The glory of the Babylonian's pride will be overthrown by God like Sodom and Gomorrah. She will never be inhabited or lived in through all generations. No Arab will pitch his tent there. No shepherd will rest his flocks there. Babylon's glory disappeared into the Mesopotamian sands. It will never be rebuilt to its former glory. Let us ask God to remove all haughtiness and kindness and cruelty from our hearts. History tells us that everything that is unlike Christ will turn into dust. The fourth beast was different from his predecessors. Daniel 7 verse 7 After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth, it was devouring, breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Oh, easy. You have to check it out with the fourth metal of iron and the huge image, which represented the Roman Empire who ruled from 168 BC to 476 AD. 
At the Rathaus or City Hall in Nuremberg, the reformer Leonard Kern sculpted the line of Daniel 7 in 1617. Nebuchadnezzar's presence identified it as the Babylonian Empire. Next to the bear, he placed Cyrus the Great to tell the world that it represented the Medo-Persian Empire. You see Alexander the Great next to the leopard to remind you that the third beast represents Greece. The presence of Julius Caesar next to the fourth beast identifies it as the Roman Empire. Here at Nuremberg, the greatest trial in the history of mankind was conducted, the Nazi trial. Why here? Well, I think God wanted the newsmakers of the world to see the unchangeable message of the prophecy of Daniel chapter 7. During our next lecture, we are going to look at the rise and fall of the mysterious little horn. Like the ancient empires before him, he too became proud and intolerant and persecuted those who differed with him. The more I study the reasons for the rise and fall of ancient civilizations, the more I realize how important it is to be kind and polite to other people and to keep God on the throne of our hearts. Jesus is coming soon to take kind people to heaven. What I desire more than anything else is to be more like the kind, courteous and lovely Jesus. What about you? Dear listener, if you desire to be more kind and courteous like Jesus, I invite you to close your eyes while I pray for you. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, it is our desire to be like Jesus. Touch us with your Holy Spirit, so that we may become transformed in his image and glorify your name. Amen. As we study the prophecies of Daniel, you will discover how relevant it is. We are all influenced today by history. You cannot afford to miss the continuation of this gripping story.